This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream, home to thousands of nonfiction documentaries from some of the best filmmakers in the world. Follow the link below to start your free trial today. Planet Earth is very well suited to life. As the only planet we know of that boasts a breathable atmosphere and oceans of liquid water, it's no wonder that complex life has flourished on our little blue dot. Our species, and many others, should feel right at home here. But that hasn't stopped entire generations of scientists and sci-fi enthusiasts from asking big what-if questions. Are there other habitable worlds out there? How far away are they? How long do we have left on Earth? The vision of leaving the Earth aboard fantastical flying cities has long been a staple of science fiction, and perhaps the most reasonable among these ideas is the concept of the generation ship, a vessel designed to support many generations of a human population over the course of a multi-century journey. In this episode, we're going to take a look at the logistics of generation ships, and see just what it would take to deliver a colony of humans to a world billions of miles away. Let's start with the basics. While warp drives and faster-than-light travel are probably more exciting to think about, generation ships are a whole lot more likely in the short term. We currently don't have anywhere near the technology to achieve even 1% of the speed of light. A generation vessel, while still very difficult, could rely on conventional propulsion methods, making it infinitely more achievable with the current state of technology. So, what are the main things to consider when building a space vessel to support a large crew over many years? The first and most obvious requirement is space, that is, usable space aboard the vessel. Besides providing accommodations for the crew, much of the empty space on a generation ship would be used to grow food. Through a combination of hydroponics and other farming techniques, the crew could conceivably produce their own food in perpetuity. This would greatly reduce the burden of providing long-lasting food from Earth, which would spoil after a number of years anyway. Another key consideration would be the availability of water. During an interstellar voyage, there would be few, if any, opportunities to collect new water from external sources. That means that the vessel would somehow have to produce its own water, not only for drinking, but also for sanitation and irrigating crops. This would be a real challenge, and one that would be absolutely critical to the success of the mission. Then there's the issue of gravity. Assuming we wanted our human passengers to maintain any kind of reasonable muscle and bone strength, we'd need to ensure their ship could generate its own gravitational force probably through centripetal motion. The final thing to consider is that we'd need to find some very adventurous people to be our passengers. This would be a one-way trip, not only for the original passengers, but for their children, grandchildren, and on and on for many hundreds of years. That's a daunting proposition. Now that we know some of the challenges to overcome, let's look at how we could solve them. Several of the most important items hinge on the size of the vessel. The size will dictate how many passengers it can hold, how much cargo, how much interior space will be available for farming, and a large mass will also be partly responsible for generating the gravity aboard the ship. So let's start with our crew. According to one study, the absolute minimum initial number of people required to maintain a healthy level of genetic diversity is 98. This would ensure the avoidance of genetic disorders and other health problems that come with intermarrying within small populations, as long as strict guidelines were followed. This number was arrived at by considering how long it would take a vessel traveling 200 kilometers per second to make the voyage to Proxima Centauri, our nearest neighboring star. At that speed, the voyage would take 6,300 years. The more people we can fit aboard the ship, the better, because accidental deaths or illnesses could cause a serious problem if you start with the bare minimum for a successful multi-generational mission. Now, we need to keep our passengers fed, so let's consider the space requirements for a fully functional farm. Based on the calculations in the aforementioned study, the vessel would need just under half a square kilometer of available room. Using both traditional farming methods and hydro or aeroponics, this area would be used to create the resources for a full omnivorous diet, including meat, fruits, vegetables, starches, sugar, oil, and honey. As long as the crew could maintain a healthy level of genetic diversity through social engineering, and as long as the farmland is used responsibly, the generation ship could theoretically cruise through space forever, producing enough food for the carefully managed population over hundreds of generations. The problem of gravity aboard the ship could be solved rather simply. In a nutshell, make it big and make it spin. In order for centripetal force to be sufficient to generate our own gravity, the vessel would need a radius of at least 224 meters and an overall length of 320 meters. Of course, that's probably not quite big enough to fit all the needed equipment for a generation ship. We'd likely need a lot more room for farmland, sleeping quarters, essential equipment, spare equipment, control rooms, fuel, and other such considerations. Assuming we had to double the size of the vessel, it still might not be as large as you'd expect. At 640 meters long, it would still be shorter than the tallest building on Earth, the Burj Khalifa, by a pretty wide margin. 
The ship would be massive, much larger than any space vessel we've ever built, but not outside the realm of possibility. So far, all of the challenges we've considered have fairly straightforward solutions. Building and launching a generation ship would be a huge undertaking, but it's definitely something we could achieve within the next 50 to 100 years if it were made a priority. It doesn't rely on hypothetical propulsion methods and could utilize mostly already existing technology. The biggest remaining barrier would be the reliable production of water. Humans can survive a lot of things, but we can't survive without water. We would need a way to ensure the production of this vital resource for thousands of years, and in a great enough quantity to provide for a large crew and all the agricultural requirements of a farming community. It would be a real challenge to say the least. Advanced recycling techniques could help to ease the burden of freshwater production, but it wouldn't be enough by itself. If we can figure out this final piece of the puzzle, it would go a long way towards being able to present a fully realized scientific plan for a future mission. It's always fun to speculate, but having the relevant data and mission specifics on paper is the only way such a project could ever get off the ground. Who knows, maybe within our lifetime we'll see the launch of the first ever manned mission beyond the solar system. It would be thousands of years before the descendants of that crew ever reached their destination, but what an adventure that would be. If you'd like to learn more about the production of space vessels, I highly recommend you check out the Race to the Moon on CuriosityStream. It's a fascinating look at just how quickly the Cold War superpowers worked to get prototypes off the ground and into space, back when we knew next to nothing about building spacefaring vessels. If you watch my videos, you'll know that I'm a big fan of CuriosityStream. It's an online streaming service with thousands of nonfiction titles from some of the best filmmakers in the game. You can find tons of great episodes like The Race to the Moon, and they've got a bunch of material on technology and outer space, which are some of my favorites. Their giant catalog includes content on science, nature, astronomy, technology, and lifestyle, among others. Unlimited access starts at just $2.99 a month, and as a special offer just for you guys, you can get a free trial by following the link below. CuriosityStream is available on just about every platform you can imagine, so wherever you are, you'll always have access to great, interesting content. As an added bonus, your CuriosityStream subscription now comes with a free Nebula subscription. Nebula is a new streaming platform built by and for creators like Wendover Productions, Real Engineering, Kurtzkazakt, and of course, Second Thought and many others. It's a place for us to try new things and make original content that just wouldn't be possible on YouTube. Give CuriosityStream a shot and get free access to Nebula when you visit curiositystream.com slash secondthought. If you enjoyed this episode, consider dropping a like, if not, a thumbs down. While you're here, check out some of my other work. I have videos on all sorts of topics and I bet you'll find something you'll enjoy. Remember to subscribe if you'd like to see more episodes like this one, and click the bell to be notified each time I upload a new video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.